understand that there really never has been a successful application of socialism. But the appeal of socialism is, is strong. There are some, some nice paroles that uh, you can use, equality, fairness for everyone, and so forth. So it seems as if history has not ended. Uh, if you take some courses, let's say, in economic history or in uh, political history, this was the title of Francis Fukuyama's famous article in which he said, communism is gone, capitalism has won, history has ended. So Fukuyama's uh, conclusion uh, doesn't seem to be holding very well, particularly young, among young people. The Cold War ended, it's hard to say, 1989. The Soviet Union ended formally in December of 1991. So most of you were very young, if, if born at all, during the Cold War. But for people of my generation, the Cold War had a, had a huge influence. Uh, in elementary school, we would have air raid warnings. We would climb under our desks. We would learn how to um, avoid radiation, if that were possible. Uh, and uh, what I remember well, but people younger than I do not remember, is the fact that we went for a very long time with the answer to the question, which system works better? And at that time, we had the great Soviet experiment, which really was put in place in the early 1930s by Stalin. So we had that. We had the traditional world of capitalism, which at the time was in the thralls of world depression. In the United States, our vice president was from the Socialist Party. Uh, it could have been our president, except for the fact that Roosevelt switched him and Truman. And out of the Soviet Union were coming these optimistic claims about the successes of their economy. So as the West was in the midst of a Great Depression, Soviet Union was declaring victory, uh, astonishing rates of growth, uh, which were explained by the fact that they no longer were troubled by what they called the anarchy of the market. Instead of the anarchy of the market, they used uh, what they called scientific planning. So if you get together a group of very bright and dedicated people, you tell them to engage in scientific planning, and they will produce a result which is far superior uh, to capitalism. And indeed, the Soviet economy probably grew fairly rapidly in the 1930s. It also grew fairly rapidly in the 1950s, but virtually all of Europe was growing rapidly in the 1950s, and we had the German economic miracle, we had the Japanese economic miracle, so it was only in the mid to late 60s that we started seeing what uh, came to be called the period of stagnation. That is, the growth rate kept getting smaller and smaller. But still, uh, academics in particular were very reluctant to go out on a limb and s say, well, it looks as if this is not working very well. B virtually everyone has heard of the very famous pioneering economics textbook uh, called Economics by Nobel laureate Paul Samuelson. And in his 1987 edition, this is two years into Gorbachev's reign, uh, there's a quote saying, well, the Soviet Union has provided convincing proof that the socialist planned economy model can outgrow the U.S. Four years later, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, but here you had a, one of the world's most prominent economists saying publicly, seems like they're doing pretty well. So that's uh, somewhat astonishing. And it also may be explained by the fact <coughs> that 
many of our academics were rooting that this system was going to work because they themselves had, had doubts about capitalism. I've been studying this for about 45 or 50 years, and I've studied it, say, as a graduate student, just based on the Western literature, what we had found out about the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet economy started to collapse, once Gorbachev introduced what he called perestroika, or glasnost, where glasnost meant openness, that is, finally, this system can be open and, and allow freedom of expression. That was very important, Glasnost, because we could actually, uh, starting with Glasnost, go in and talk to planners, go in and talk to managers, uh, listen to what they had to say. In my intellectual development, that would have been the second phase. The first was studying the Western literature. The second was studying Soviet economy by talking to the actual players uh, in the game. And the third has occurred at um, Hoover Institution of Stanford, which is the world's largest private archive. And the Hoover uh, Institution purchased microfilms of the Soviet state and party archives. So now you can go back and sort of relive the entire Soviet experience looking at the words they actually used, the meetings they actually had, the transcripts they actually had, and so forth. So this represents the source of my knowledge, the, these three events. The 60-year puzzle derives from the writings of Ludwig von Mises and uh, F.A. Hayek. They wrote about something that came to be called the socialist controversy. Remarkably, they wrote really before, at least Mises wrote before, the Soviet command system had even been put in place. But if you read Mises and Hayek, they say that this isn't going to work. And they give some reasons why it's not going to work. One is it's too complex. How can you plan an entire economy? too complex. Secondly, because it's complex, you need a lot of information, but the information that's going to come up is not going to be accurate. There's going to be distorted information. And the third point, which has been less scrutinized, is motivation. People didn't really think about this this issue, the issue of motivation. First, you have to ask, well, what's going to motivate the leaders? What's going to motivate Stalin? Then, what's going to motivate the subordinates? What's going to motivate the ministry officials? What's going to motivate uh, the, the factory managers? They're basically uh, public employees. So everyone's a public employee. Then you have this very small leadership at the top. So what's What's going to motivate people? In capitalist societies, um, we rely on the profit motive uh, as a major motivational factor. But now you're running a state enterprise, and you have a plan that somebody's giving to you. So what's your objective function? What, what is it you're going to try to do? So if you share with me my experience of, of going into the actual archives of the party and the state, you'll see that it wasn't very easy being a factory manager in those days. It was particularly tough during the Stalin years because if you did something wrong, uh, it could mean the gulag or it could mean execution. The managers were in a very high-risk profession. If you read these documents, you'll see that it seems fairly simple because the Constitution says the obligation of every Soviet citizen, in, that included managers, is to fulfill the plan. The plan is law, and it is your job to fulfill the plan. And there are some other scary things in there, the most frightening of which is um, anyone 
who diminishes the economic achievements of the Soviet Union is a criminal. So what does that mean? Anyone who diminishes the economic achievements of the Soviet Union is a criminal. I, if I were a manager, I'd have a tough time figuring out whether what I'm doing diminishes the economic achievements of the Soviet Union. What are you going to do as a manager? Uh, you're supposed to fulfill the plan. You can't diminish the economic achievements of the Soviet Union or else you're in really bad trouble. Your goal in life is to achieve a quiet life. Uh, now what in the world does that mean, a uh, quiet life? What it means is uh, if you're a factory manager, you bargain for the lowest possible output targets and you bargain for more inputs than you need because uh, they might come in handy. So your goal is a quiet life. Uh, and in order to have a quiet life, you need to get yourself a job where you have no risks. You need to get yourself a job where you don't stand out. So there are any number of cases in the archives where the, t the best managers uh, try to demote themselves. Uh, if you are offered the job of building a dam, that's almost a death sentence right there. So. Uh, Managers, we learn, their objective in life was a quiet life, which says a lot about planning because what it says about planning is you, you're gathering a lot of information, but most of it is no good. Yet you are a scientific planner, and in order to, uh, for scientific planning to work, it has to have accurate information. I think this part of the Mises Hayek critique has been um, not given enough thought. Uh, and this is one of the things that jumps out at you when you uh, look at the, ar at the archives. Uh, now, how about the leaders? How about Stalin's inner circle? And there we know an awful lot because Stalin, who was an incredibly hard worker, would usually take off for two months in the summer to go to um, the Black Sea. This meant Stalin's out of Moscow. Scientific planning is still going on. Therefore, there would be daily telegrams and letters. The telephone still wasn't very reliable. So you see Stalin managing the economy and managing politics you know, thousands of miles away from from Moscow, so we have all this correspondence. What, what were Stalin's big concerns? Uh, his biggest concern was not the economy. His biggest concern was really power. It's a power struggle. And I think that means we, those who studied this subject before the opening of the archives need to go back and restate that because uh, it, the, the idea was that Stalin or any other leader, their goal would be to maximize growth rates, uh, make good choices on public investments and so forth. But Stalin's biggest concern always was the power and the power struggle. So much of what he's doing in this correspondent is managing this power struggle. Stalin managed the power people thought initially would not be very powerful. The position was General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Doesn't sound very impressive, but he turned it into the pinnacle of power. He, like Lenin, for example, assigned apartments to the inner circle. He, like Lenin, decided who would get to go to the spa in Germany. So he had all these material treats that he, he dangled in front of his uh, others, but he also made it virtually impossible to engage in a conspiracy against him. So if you were a member of the Politburo, you could not meet informally another Politburo member on a street corner. Uh, if you did and it was noted, you would have committed one of the worst crimes possible. So everything he did, uh, he did with an eye towards the power struggle and making sure 
there, there's some sense to this as well as personal um, safety. There's some sense to this because if you have scientific planning and the scientific planning is being done by an omniscient party so it can make no mistakes, this means you cannot have different positions. You cannot take different positions in the, in the Politburo. Uh, so if you had a position that differed from Stalin, you had to keep quiet about it in public and eventually you were going to lose your position and lose your life. Uh, so Stalin called this factionalism. So we cannot have factionalism. Uh, there are all kinds of rules to prevent factionalism, but I think you get the idea of it. Complexity. This is the first thing that uh, people pick up from Hayek and Mises. One of the best books on Soviet planning was published in 1980 by a French economist by the name of Zaleski. And it's a very useful book because it has virtually all the available numbers in them. Uh, one number is particularly striking, and I want you to think about it. Uh, according to Zaleski, <clears throat> he figured out that the Soviet economy in the late 30s produced about 10 million distinct products. 10 million. They prepared what they call central balances for 10,000. 10 million products, they actually plan 10,000. So what's going on? You know, is this a planned economy if you're only planning a very small fraction of 1%? Uh, the answer to this is that, um, and this comes directly from Lenin, uh, this is the notion of commanding heights. So if you control the railroads, if you, can, if you control the banks, if you control steel production, everything else, you drag everything else behind. Uh, and so that's how you have an economy which is formally identified as a planned economy which plans at most only 10,000 products. Now this brings me to the, what I consider to be the basic flaw that really killed the system. And we really didn't understand the significance of this until emigre economists started to come to the U.S. From, from what was then Soviet Union. They came to us and they said, you better pay attention to something called planning from the achieved level for these products that were actually planned at the center. It was basically an accounting enter uh, enterprise. On the left-hand side, they tallied up, well, how much steel do we have this year? How much coal do we have this year? Um, how many freight cars do we have this year? That's this side. On this side, they say, who needs coal? Who needs freight cars? Who needs this? Who needs that? And then you <clears throat> look at the two, and you will see to your... Uh, regret that what people want is a lot more than what's available. You then engage in what's called material balance planning. So you start juggling things around. You take away some steel from this person. You tell the steel producer to produce a little more. So you juggle all of this until Eventually, you come up with something that sort of looks like a balance. So, and all this is done without prices. Prices don't play a role in this, which is the most famous Hayek-Mises critique. How can you plan if you don't know relative scarcity? How, how can you plan if you don't know this is a deficit good, this is a surplus good? So all this material balancing took place uh, without prices. There's, no interest in prices whatsoever. So this was the <clears throat> Soviet innovation, material balance planning. So if you would have read their textbooks of, of, of the day, 
you would have learned a great deal about all the balances they put together and how wonderful this was because it was uh, scientific planning. Okay, that's what we knew. Then the Soviet immigre economists came and said, look, look into something called planning from the achieved level. What does that mean? <clears throat> it means the planning process consists of taking last year's plan, um, making a few little adjustments, and these little adjustments would then be this year's plan, planning from the achieved level. <clears throat> well, it sounds harmless. Um, this is the way I think the federal government budgets. You know, it's last year's and then you fiddle around and make some uh, small adjustments. So this was the foundation of their planning. So it sounds harmless, but in my opinion, this is really what killed the system. I'm quite convinced that if you were to take a manager of Ford Motor Plant today and send that manager back to 1930, the manager wouldn't know what to do. It's an entirely different world, 1930 in 2017. If you sent a Soviet plant manager back, he'd feel quite at home. You know, nothing had changed. Pretty much the same products are still being produced, which is remarkable. When we were calculating independently Soviet GDP, those economists who were trying to calculate inflation had a very easy job, because if you wanted to know what had happened to the to the cost of producing a lathe, you didn't have to worry about quality adjustments because the same lathe was produced in 1960 that was produced in 1930, no change whatsoever. So in effect, scientific planning ended up sort of freezing the economy in place. The exception was the military because in the military you can't afford to stand still. You have enemies out there. And so you had a quite different system for planning and operating the military. But I again go back and say planning from the achieved level was the foundation of Soviet planning and it explains why the thing couldn't work. Soft budget constraint, the term really was, to, was formulated by a Hungarian economist, Janos Kornai, who grew up in socialist Hungary, so he saw it firsthand. And uh, <clears throat> he said one of the big problems of the planned economy is soft budget constraints. Now, what's a soft budget constraint? If we look at the U.S. economy, we'll see some soft budget constraints. A soft budget con constraint exists when you know you will automatically be <coughs> bailed out. If you're running losses, if you're too big to fail, you don't worry that much because, I mean, it's not pleasant, but you're gonna be automatically bailed out. So we have, bu we have soft budget enterprises here in the U.S. They are the exception, and hopefully they'll remain the exception. But according to Kornai's analysis of Hungary, of communist Hungary, just about every enterprise has a soft budget constraint. And he proposed getting rid of the soft budget constraint, but there's really no way to get rid of it in such an economy. And the explanation is very simple, and that is, just think you have this material balance. You have steel available, uses of steel, and you have to have a, an approximate balance. Let's now say that um, a big steel producer can't cover its costs and the Ministry of Finance isn't stepping up and so forth. What if that company went under? It would stop producing the steel 
and that steel is going into the material balance, so the material balance is destroyed. So as long as you have an output-oriented economy, uh, you're going to have a, an output-oriented planned economy. You're going to have a soft budget. You're going to have soft budget constraints. Anything bad about that? Well, what's bad about it is who's going to worry about costs? Who's going to worry about efficiency? No matter what you do, somebody's going to bail you out. <clears throat> Surprisingly, when you go into the archives and look at the 1920s, budget, soft budgets were there in the 1920s. The, the state bank spent all its time bailing out companies in the 1920s. There were unpaid workers in the 1920s. So the soft budget constraint has been there uh, forever. And uh, if you think core and I through, you understand it's, it was basically inevitable. Let me try two more topics. Uh, one is um, the reform stalemate. If you look at the Soviet planned economy, it was put in place in pretty much by 1931. Uh, under Stalin, there could be no criticism of the Soviet planned economy because the Central Committee and the Communist Party were developing scientific plans. They knew what was best. Uh, therefore, if something went wrong, who is to blame? The managers, in particular. Uh, Stalin, the very famous quote, saying cadres, by that he meant sort of the leading industrial personnel, decide everything. So if there's a major screw-up, it's not because the scientific plan was unscientific. It's because these um, cadres were making mistakes. And why were they making mistakes? Yeah, they are uh, in the employ of uh, the Japanese, the Germans, what have you, and there were huge numbers of executions where the charge was spy for the Japanese, spy for the Germans, etc. Uh, so cadres decide everything. Um, so if this is true, if Stalin is correct, this means you really can't say we need to reform the system. You don't need to reform the system because the system is perfect. So under Stalin, there was no discussion of reform. And it wasn't until Khrushchev, 1954 and then 57, that discussion, how do we improve the economy, started. It led nowhere. There were some reform attempts, but they were always blocked. So one question is this reform stalemate. Everyone knew what was going on. Everyone knew, could see these problems. So why was there, particularly after Stalin's death, no meaningful reform? And the answer is, is I think, easy, uh, and that is that you basically had two groups. You had the planners, you had the enterprise managers, and there was profound distrust between the two. And this distrust you find all the way back in 1928 or so, where uh, the head of industry, a fellow with a long name, Orjanikidze, was blasting in a letter to Stalin Get these, get these bureaucrats off my back. Just let me run my factories and you'll have everything you need. The bureaucrats fight back. Arjunikidze is a cheater. He's, he's going to cheat the entire nation. He's going to run things his way. So we, we, we can't get off his back. And that continued all the way through. And the feeble attempts at reform were easily brushed back by this stalemate. Question is, how did the stalemate end? Because um, something must have happened.
And this brings us to the end of the Soviet Union uh, when Gorbachev allowed open discussion. Uh, Gorbachev said, I'm not interested in reform, I'm interested in radical reform. So Gorbachev said, I want radical reform. Now you come to a very interesting point, and that is that, let's say you're, you're the, the head of, of Kogalim Oil, huge oil fields in Western Siberia. You're earning a couple thousand dollars a month. Your business is in the billions of dollars. <clears throat> But you're just a bureaucrat. You're just an administrator. Now somebody comes along and says, we need radical reform. And that radical reform may include uh, privatization. It may allow the managers and the workers to actually start making decisions. So now, if you are that manager of Kogalim, you can say, hey, <clears throat> I might better get on board with this because if I'm smart, I'll end up as an owner of oil fields that, are, that could be capitalized at um, $300 billion. So that, that is really what caused a reform which was totally unrealistic to take place. It was the fact that those people who were running the system saw, you know, we'll be, a, we'll be rich if this reform goes through. Um, the manager of Kogalim um, is deceased, so out of this thinking came Luke Oil, which is worth, you know, eighty hundred billion dollars in stock exchanges. So um, when given the choice of staying with the old system or going to a new system where you stood a chance of making a lot of money, um, that's when those who ran the economy decided, let's get rich. And so you didn't have the opposition. And the nice thing about it was <clears throat> that the planners could get rich too. Uh, how would they get rich? Well. Uh, the way to get rich in Russian oil in those days was to get export licenses because the internal price of a barrel of oil was about three dollars. It sold for sixty dollars in international markets, but in order to get it to the sixty dollar market you needed a permit to send the oil through an export pipeline. So you're making huge amounts of money, so why not share it with, <clears throat> with the ministry official who handles the uh, export licenses? And in fact, the deputy minister who handled the export licenses in those days was followed by five bodyguards uh, because he had something that everyone wanted. So that completes my presentation. And uh, maybe we have time for a few questions. What do you think uh, the Soviet Russia's uh, economic model would have looked like under the leadership of Leon Trotsky? Um, do you think it would have been more effective in the long run than Stalin's? Trotsky has quite a few admirers still today. <clears throat> a good friend of mine, Bob Service, wrote a biography of Trotsky. And whenever he would present, there would be violent demonstrations because uh, Trotsky's followers thought that he had misrepresented Trotsky. Um, Trotsky lost the power struggle. And once he was outside, he was banished outside of Russia, eventually ended up in Mexico. But he carried on a, um, a, a very effective propaganda campaign against the Stalin regime. And his argument was that Stalin had bureaucratized the economy, and if he were in charge, he would, he would have had more democracy, et cetera. So the system that he promised after he'd lost the power struggle you know, has its appeal. 
And this explains why, if you look at, um, go on the internet and look for Trotsky organizations, they're everywhere. Uh, I think he was making the arguments he made simply because he'd already lost. But, uh, and I'm not a great student of Trotsky. Yes? So Yugoslavia was an example of a democratization of uh, socialism. What is it? it? We call it uh, market socialism or labor managed <coughs> socialism. In fact, there were um, a few proponents of, of the Yugoslav model in uh, Western academic circles. And there were a number of dissertations written about how well this would work. Um, and it, it, the basic idea was sort of a commune, uh, worker-managed enterprises. Uh, we don't know the extent to which it really worked that way or not. And then when Tito died, it all fell apart. But there were, I don't know, 10, 20 dissertations written on this um, when uh, Tito was in power. You seem to place a lot of emphasis on the uh, differences between the bureaucrats and the factory managers. Do you think there was a way at any point to bridge the gap between uh, factory managers and bureaucrats? Or in other words, were there a point before radical reforms where there could have been light reforms to bridge this gap? Uh, the the <clears throat> Western economists really were wide of the mark because they felt there was an easy solution out there. You just give the managers a little more uh, freedom, um, you know, take away a little power from the ministerial officials or from the state planning commission officials, and everything would be fine. What we learned when the radical form reform actually went into effect is that this is very bad advice. So when Soviet economists visited Harvard's Russian Research Center in the 60s. They're always told, loosen up, you know, let your managers, um, give your managers more freedom. Uh, but when the managers were really given freedom, the big problem was that um, you can't just, and Gorbachev's first steps were, were aimed at destroying the ministerial structure, at destroying the um, Central Committee Economic Department. So Gorbachev said, these administrators have, have blocked all reforms, so we'll get rid of them. So he basically did get rid of them, but there, there was no market. The state was still setting the prices. There was no market. The price of oil was, whatever it was, $5. Uh, and so there was no compromise, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, supplies were highly subsidized by the government. I wanted to ask, um, how much of a role do you think would play in the great Soviet class, especially with Erdogan? Uh, subsidies were enormous, uh, and we didn't really know that until the Soviet immigrants came. <clears throat> the <clears throat> agricultural subsidies were something like 5 6% of GDP, which is about half of the defense budget. Uh, the Russian leadership was always very worried about ra uh, ra uh, raising food prices. And therefore, uh, they would hold the food price constant, but pay the agricultural workers more. And so that led to this huge budget uh, deficit. I have a question uh, to your opening line, which is about the millennium and socialism and sort of um, the lessons we learned from the Soviet Union about uh, socialism. But my question is about is why you couple socialism with Stalinism, right? Because there are so many different types of socialism, and it's not very clear that millennials or any of the, any other people who are socialists are necessarily uh, enamored with Stalinism. And Stalinism is one particular form, and that does not very much conform to what Marx expected is going to happen. So I'm just curious as to why you couple those things. Well. Uh, remember, Bernie Sanders was careful to say, I don't believe in socialism, I believe in democratic socialism. So the question you're raising is, uh, can a uh, socialist economic and political system be democratic? Uh, I don't think we have a, um, a real world example where that works. <clears throat> 
Um, and I would say if Bernie Sanders had said, yeah, I'm a socialist, I really like Stalin, I don't think he would have gotten much, much support. If, if I'm in, invited back at some point, I'd like to address that question, which is, does the socialist economic system really uh, um, create violence? And I think there are reasons for thinking so. So that's the best I can do for now, though. Uh, Professor Gregory, could you help to explain the external factors that led to the failure of the Soviet experiment, especially the containment policy and the President Reagan? That's, of course, a big question uh, because uh, the su supporters of Reagan say he brought the Soviet system to its collapse. And he did so through Star Wars and other things. Uh, then there are those who say Star Wars and Reagan had very little to do with it. Um, I'm, I'm at Hoover, where George Shultz uh, reigns. And I've heard his discussion of uh, this period and how he personally taught Gorbachev some, some economics. Uh, the big external factors were Soviet Union had big debt. Uh, Soviet Union was devoting huge portions of its resources to military and couldn't really compete with the United States. And this was the period where the U.S. economy started growing uh, rapidly. If this discussion had been in 1980, the Soviet Union could have said, we're not doing well, but look what's going on in the, in the Western world. You have stagflation, you have energy crisis, you have all these problems. So I think the biggest external factor, however you want to interpret it, was the fact that the U.S. economy seemed to be doing well and the, and the Soviet economy not. Um, what is your view on ex-KGB agent Soviet defector Alexander Galitsyn's uh, claims that the Soviet Union is merely lying dormant underneath um, a guise of democratic ideals in the Russian Federation? Do you think that he was accurate in that claim? The saddest thing of all is the fact that Russia really had a chance under Yeltsin to become a democratic society. The KGB was very weak. At that point, they were, hi they were hiring themselves out as bodyguards. Um, so the, 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 the big loss was the fact that Yeltsin turned out to be corrupt. His family was corrupt. And uh, by that time, the KGB had sort of reconstituted itself and was the only organization that could mm -hmm. guarantee Yeltsin and his family safety you know, after he left office. Um, now, if you look at the leadership of Russia, it consists of ex-KGB, friends of Putin from Petersburg, um, and that's about it. So, um, you know, KGB is back. One last question, and that is, uh, one of the things you didn't talk about was Lenin's new economic plan. Yeah. Right, which goes to early on to, to show that, you know, planning process was actually failing quite early on, right after the revolution. Um, and so I wondered if you could just briefly talk about what was going on, what sort of brought about uh, Lenin's idea of the plan, and then sort of Stalin's backlash against that that we saw. The new economic policy was introduced by Lenin in March of 21. It was introduced because the country was falling apart. Uh, it was falling apart because um, the Lenin had, was sending out the troops, the militia, the secret police to the countryside and confiscating uh, the grain. So uh, the, the countryside was on the verge of counter-revolution. The sailors at Kronstadt were rising up against the Soviets. So Lenin had little choice. So he introduced this sort of mixed economy called new economic policy. Uh, and it worked very well. And the economic recovery began. There were astonishing rates of growth. And this is what Stalin and Bukharin were fighting about. Bukharin said, things are going great. 
let's, let's continue this. And Stalin said, we can't allow our policy to be dictated by peasants. So we need to gain control over them, even if it means losing a lot of agricultural output. So, uh, and it was felt, by the way, among uh, Western economists, say in the 80s, that the most likely reform would be sort of a restoration of NEP, uh, the new economic policy, but that didn't happen. So that's my answer. I'll ask you to join me in um, thanking Professor Gregory for his time.